it is statistically significant. It is, in my mind, one of the silver bullets for Discover. I've got problems here. And so I started seeing the power of this. And then I started med picking my own deals. And I was like, holy God. And when I actually took MedPick, operationalized it myself, used it to find gaps in my deals, and then run plays and take action, I literally made almost a million dollars that year. Um, it was my highest W-2 year ever. I ended up getting promoted. And from that point on, I have taught every human I've possibly met this because it is that life-changing. That's the story. Well, anybody wants to fight me on this, fight me on, <laughs> fight me right here on this. In the comment. <laughs> All right. Hello and welcome back to Masters of Medic. Today I have an absolute master with me, Mr. David Weiss. How are you doing, sir? Andy, thanks for having me on, man. I'm doing awesome. I'm pumped for this conversation. Yeah, me too. Me too. We've been talking for a long time. I think one of the the things we both love about our medic ecosystem is just that there's so many folks who are really passionate about what we do, selling mostly, but also the medic part of it. Um, so getting getting a chance to get your expertise. Um, I've been a massive, massive fan of your view of the world, sales, and all things you say about medic for a while. So to get you on the show is great. Why don't you tell uh, our audience a little bit about yourself, David? Yeah, Andy, feelings mutual, sir. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a 20-year uh, sales sales leader. Um, I, I like to feel like I'm, you know, still an operator, still a high-level practitioner. Um, today, I am the uh, chief revenue officer for a company called the Sales Collective. So, uh, we bill ourselves as a sales transformation company. So, the whole thought is, uh, we don't want to put you in a box when it comes to how uh, you need to solve revenue challenges. Mm -hmm. um, we like to look at the, the ecosystem. We like to look at your entire way of going to market and generating revenue and then figure out, hey, look, do you, do you need more people, better people? Do you need to assess and coach and develop the people you have? Is it a technology problem where we can create scale with your business with tech? Is it a process problem? We need to stand up, document and implement processes. Do you need to onboard? Do we need to train? Do we need to help leaders be better leaders? Um, do we need to insert, you know, chief uh, or fractional uh, chief revenue officers to, to guide everything? Like, where is the challenge? And let's work together to solve it. And that's really the approach to the business. And that's the business I lead. And it's, um, it's a lot of fun because it's, it's what I love doing and, and helping companies. with. So uh, it's cool when you get to merge the side hustle and the main hustle together and, and actually, you know, yeah. do, do what you love doing. So, yeah. yeah, totally relate to that. You know, we're in a funny kind of way similar in that, you know, we both salespeople turn sales leaders. And now we get to talk sales whilst do, being salespeople and sales leaders. It's like the, it's like the, the, the tri trifecta of what we want to be doing. So that's super cool. So yeah. the show is Masters of Medic. So we, we should definitely start there. How did you find out about Medic and maybe give us a little bit of insight into your, your, your journey? Um, my, my origin you story. Find, yeah, you, oh, I like that. Origin, yeah, the Medic yeah. origin. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, dipped in a vat of uh, radioactive and uh, you know, <laughs> fluid, and then I pulled out, and it was like boom. Um, so uh, it's funny. So I, I want to go back. Like this is um, almost ten years ago. Mm -hmm. So I was working ADP. Mm -hmm. I was uh, a um, global uh, sales executive, kind of like a strat account executive for them. Uh, it was the year before I became. Uh, one of their leaders in the uh, RPO BPO business for them. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a new leader. There was an org change. And I normally hate org changes because they almost never go well. And I almost always get stuck with a leader who's just, you know, I, I don't know how bad I want to disparage people, but uh, <laughs> just a terrible human normally. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, so I was really dreading it. And so this, mm -hmm. this guy came in um, and to my surprise, it was one of the greatest leaders I've ever worked for to this day. Um, he's still a friend of mine. His name is Gregory Donovan. And Gregory, um, him and I still talk every week. And Gregory uh, taught me MedPick. Now, anybody who also knows me, um, 
if you try and tell David me I'm not doing good enough, I have a problem with that. Um, cause I normally work really, really, really hard and I normally spend a lot of time mastering whatever craft I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. So when someone says you can do better, I'm normally like, you can piss off. Um, <laughs> cause I've already worked that Like I, I can't work more hours than I do. Um, but Gregory came in and introduced me to MedPick and I pushed back. I was like, I don't need it. I already have a process. I already have a methodology, I already have an approach, and it's already successful. I'm already one of the top sellers in the business. I'm good. Mm-hmm. And he's like, no, I think you could really benefit from this. And I'm like, I'm good. He's like, can I just teach it to you? And I'm like, sure. So he taught it to me, and I was like, I'm good. <laughs> but on every single deal review call, every single pipeline call, he would just simply ask me, hey, David, What's the business case for this deal and what metrics drive it? Hey, David, who's the economic buyer? Are we with them? And he would just med pick me and he would do it in such a nice way. It was just simply like, let's point out where you've got a problem in this deal. And then Mm -hmm. let's talk about how you can go close that gap to win more. And eventually I was like, man, these are great questions. And ooh, I've got problems here. And so I started seeing the power of this. And then I started med picking my own deals. And I was like, holy God. And when I actually took med pick, operationalized it myself, used it to find gaps in my deals and then run plays and take action. I literally made almost a million dollars that year. Um, it was my highest W2 year ever. I ended up getting promoted. And from that point on, I have taught every human I've possibly met this because it is that life changing. That's wow. the story. First question back to you. What would you think you would have done that year without MedPick? Easily half as much. Half. Easily. Half. And that's yeah. me being like, still puffing my chest out a little bit. Like, yeah, I would have been. Yeah. <laughs> this resonates with me. I'm sure it resonates with loads of people watching and listening. Um, who, who've kind of been on their, a similar sort of journey themselves. What the, the thing that's interesting to me is that a lot of what you were talking about there was about using it to spot the gaps, you know, kind of like see opportunities to, to increase your chances of winning. And, and how most people classically use medic is, is like that. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of to, to sort of qualify where they are in the opportunity and, and the opportunity, you know, strengths and weaknesses and that kind of thing. But the, the kind of the way I think about how you were talking about that is it's like, you're still the same salesperson, right? Underneath you were still, so you were, you were using it as this framework to identify gaps, let's say, and then you were applying what you already said right at the top, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Like I, I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm very well versed at this. And so really, you know, in your story and in so many people's story, all it was doing was kind of acting like, and we like to use this sort of term of it being like your co-pilot. You were like, you were maverick in this example, in this story, right? You've got like MedPick as, as goose right next to you saying, Hey, like asking you yeah. those questions, obviously, you know, the ejector seat in your year worked uh, <laughs> and goose didn't like launch himself into that but um you know so that's where that i love that analogy so much but it always breaks because of you know goose so anyway um but yeah so it's interesting interesting always fascinates me that yeah man and, and look i um i've rarely met a seller especially a top performer seller seller that doesn't get myopic that yeah. doesn't look at their deal and think I'm running a good sales process. Right. Um, I know how to sell. I've rarely met someone that's like, that's really good at a craft. That's like, I need help. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm failing. Like, but MedPick did that for me. MedPick mm-hmm. created a, a way that I could remove blinders mm-hmm. and myopathy in my own deals and scientifically, objectively, show me where I may have something I'm not seeing. Right. Um, and, and that it, to me is the power and the beauty and behind it is uh, it, it, it gives you that lens that in common language and common view 
Um, so you can ask for help of people that also know this thing and they can see it and help you in the way that they know you need because of it. Um, that without it, man, I, I, I don't ever think I would have been as successful as I am. And that, right. that's, that's why I love it so much. It's, the interesting thing about your story, which is slightly different to mine, was that you, as you said, you were a top performer before Epic. I wasn't. Like I had been a top performer relative to being like a, a big fish in a small pond in like startups and that kind of that world of before I kind of a, 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 a sort of evolved my experience and career to kind of step up to the top level, like places, I don't say top level being Oracle, but like there's like a, it's almost like you're into a new world when you're enterprise selling at places like Oracle. And I remember like arriving there and, you know, had success behind me, but I'm looking around at the people I got to work with and I was like, whoa, like these people just, they just seem to be on another level to what I am. I never for a moment thought I wouldn't get there, but I just thought that it was going to be time that would get me there. And I thought that like, I just knew like it, the way I describe it is it's like they were playing sales in easy mode if it was a computer game and I was playing it in hard mode. Right. But the, 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 the small minded person would go, Oh, they've got all the good accounts. They've got the good leads. I knew that wasn't the case. Right. And so I just knew I had to get better, but I didn't know what it was. And when I actually learned med pick, that was what did it for me. Like, and so I kind of, I kind of, it, it unlocked my full potential is how I like to say it, but it didn't happen like overnight. Like I, they taught, I, I learned med pick and I was like, okay, this makes total sense. But there's not a bit I didn't understand, not a bit I didn't think would benefit me, but I had to like lean in and it probably took a month before it really kind of, I won't say clicked, but a month before I really got it in its full context, like where I started to really understand how the decision criteria fitted, the decision process fitted, the real difference between a coach and a champion, those types of things. But I say it's probably like three months before it felt natural. And then maybe six months before it became like second nature, where I was just part of my muscle memory. How was it for you? Like, do you remember like how you sort of lent into it? Yeah, it, it was, it was quick for me. Um, cause what, what's interesting is like, MedPick didn't teach me necessarily anything new about sales. Mm -hmm. What it taught me is how to look at the process I was running and figure out where I, I would lose, where my risk was, where I had missed a step, where I didn't go deep enough. And then it forced me to level up in those areas, um, in those deals. Um, because it can be hard to do all the things all the time in every deal. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and I hate to say this for you sellers listening, but you, if you want to win, you kind of have to, mm -hmm. because if you're not running a great process, and somebody else is, you have risk. Um, and, and that's what, again, to me is the beauty and, and the elegance and the power is every, and, and this is how I operationalize it. I literally have, still have the whiteboard in my office, even though I'm not running cycles, it's yeah. still there. Yeah. And I, every morning I would look at my whiteboard, I would look at a deal, and I'd med pick it in my mind and, and I'd ask myself questions. Do I know this? Where am I at with that? And I would color code them. I'd be like red, yellow, green. I'm red mm -hmm. here. Today, David, you need to take this, is my inner monologue. You need to take action to move this red to yellow or this yellow to green in this area. And you can do that by starting to do this, this, and this. And I, it would literally be my system. And, um, so I, once I, once I learned that, like that moved really fast for me. Um, and I think we talked about like everything I do, I do it at, at, at a high urgency because of my fear of mortality, but, um, yeah, no, I, I picked it up quick. Um, uh, to, because to me it was simple, but it was also yeah. power in that. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love how you kind of, how you're talking about this is, is, what's naturally coming across is that you are focused on spotting what we would call the gaps, the gaps in your opportunity. And I think one of the things I'd love to get your view on that I think our industry gets wrong, and this is very much for me a cultural issue, is that this concept that if a salesperson has a gap with their opportunity with their deal, 
it's re it's representative of them not doing a good job with the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Whereas my view of the world, our view of the world would be if there's a salesperson who has identified a gap with their opportunity, they've done their job, they've done a good job, right? Because mm -hmm. selling isn't a linear process where if you put in at the front end, you put in um, a good prospect, like a qualified prospect who needs your product, has pain that you can solve, who has unlimited budget, and then you've got the best product in the world for them, and then you are the best salesperson. Those are like the perfect ingredients, right? It's not gonna be a guaranteed deal, right? Even in the path, every, like, everything's like 10 out of 10 in terms of how you'd want it. It's not a guaranteed deal because there's a whole, a whole world of things that can happen. People believe like, economical things uh like scandals like there's like a there's like a gazillion things that can happen in the perfect scenario that you still need to be on your game even the best scenario to spot those gaps because only once you spot find those gaps can you fix them and so i do think there's two parts to this there's the finding the gaps which is where medpick obviously really helps very 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 strong in terms of like seeing how well you know, how strong your value proposition is, how strong your value is in the eyes of the customer, how well engaged you are with the stakeholders, how well do you understand the customer's process? Like it's brilliant at that. And so that's part one. Part two, which is that cultural bit that I talked about, which is if I'm a salesperson in a sales team and I have, you know, probably similar to your, to your manager that you, you mentioned that you work with that talked to you about MedPick, this great vibe, this great culture where I feel like respected, I feel like they understand my value, then I'm going to be much more likely to stick my hand and say, you know, hey boss, um, got this great opportunity right now with ABC. Here's like, here's where we're at. But I haven't like this, I just can't find a champion or I can't find a way to the economic buyer or this is their decision criteria. I can't seem to influence it away. And I think I can, you know, whatever the problem is, whatever the gap is, it, that's me doing the best possible job I could possibly be doing in that scenario because there's probably more people in the business that can come, come together and do reviews and team sessions to help me there. Um, and so I think that's as much of like, as much as the actual framework, helping people spot those gaps, you've got to get the culture, right? What do you think? Yeah, man. So I've got, I've got a philosophy that a lot of people will probably disagree with. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I've got like, like if, if I, I have a way of looking at sales that I, I don't want to call it like seeing past the matrix. Mm -hmm. Um, but I almost relate it to that. And, and the, this is the concept. The concept is a stageless sales process. Mm -hmm. um, I do not believe in stages. Okay. Um, I believe like if I'm looking at like my theory of sales, there's, there, there's really, there's, there's two components. There's a, there's circular motion um, mm -hmm. and there's no stages. Um, it is things that have happened. So now certain things do happen in certain stages, but they don't have to. Um, okay. And even though they happened here, it doesn't mean you won't circular motion back to them over mm -hmm. time, like a discovery motion, like a, a solution presentation or alignment mm -hmm. motion, like a business mm -hmm. case creation and expansion motion. Um, yep. Those things you learn. And then as you go through learning, you go back and then you continue. And so I'm like, I, I, there's not a lot of people who believe what I believe. Um, I hear very few people talking about it, if any, but I don't believe sales should be should be stage driven. Um, I believe in the stageless sales process in the stageless sales process. It's not about the stage you're in. It's about what you've accomplished in the deal. Mm -hmm. And that view has allowed me to layer MedPick on top of it mm -hmm. and say, where again, where are the gaps? What have I not done yet? How do I figure that out? And because there are no stages, it's not like I have to do this at this point and this point, we're not there yet or any of that crap. It's, it's, here's the problem. What am I going to go do to solve it? So I can, in a way, check a box or cross it off or, or do one of the needed things that I know I need to do to win. And by approaching it that way, it, it almost, it's a little bit of like infinite game theory in a way, but it's like, you know, the, the job is to keep the, the ball in the air and find a way through the motion to accomplish the thing. And it's, um, it's just a different way of looking at it. But I, I feel like at some point the sales world is going to adopt this and transfer to this. And the only reason it hasn't is because of Salesforce and CRMs that force you 
to go through these stages and that's how they freaking set things up. And I think that that's the limiting factor here is the way we track deals and the way deals actually work are not aligned. And yeah. that is a problem. Yeah, because I, I see what you're saying there. And there's a there's like a really strong angle, I think, on this that would underpin your your thoughts, which is like customers don't buy to our sales process, right? We've got like whatever your sales process is different from the cust like we don't go in to meet the customer in the first meeting going, by the way, we're in stage one right now. And before we can get to stage two, I need to check, you know, do these things with you and all that kind of stuff. Like customers, you know, they have their own way of doing stuff, which is like, you know, which is the beauty of actually why I think MedPick has stood the test of time because it's literally reverse engineered from how customers buy. Um, yes. And so, yeah, in that world, I, I totally see where, you, where you're coming from. The, 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 the thing I'll throw back to you, because I, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. I, I think they're, I think there needs to be a, um, uh, I don't, I, I agree that it's not like, um, like discovery, for example, like I don't think discovery is a stage, right? That's, that's complete nonsense to class discovery as a stage. Even if you, even if you take away all of the layers that make great, great salespeople great, and you just look at it from like a perspective of meeting one, I meet one person and then I, I, is discovery supposed to be done then? I've done a great job. I've got a second meeting. Now all of a sudden there's three people in this meeting. Am I not going to do discovery with them? Like that's like table stakes, right? So even in that regard, but also the fact that, you know, by meeting two, meeting three, they've probably met the competition. If the competition's done a good job, they should have, they should have taken them off the course that we we're on at least a little bit. They should at least influence their thinking towards their, their way of thinking a little bit. We need one. If we don't discover that, we're, we're going to carry on going this way, thinking they're with us and we'll turn around like, well, where did they go? Where did yeah. they go? And they're like, so, you know, that's, that's an example there. And I think the same goes, you know, now we, we live in this world of, you know, customer life cycles, not one-time sales, which has been the case for, uh, for like two decades now. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, but people still like to kind of point out, you know, that, uh, the sales process is, well, the sales process is still very much set up for that start and end. And in, in relationship, um, which we know is, is, is not the case. Yep. Yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm, a I I'm can't wait until Salesforce or somebody, you know, figures this out and, and, and creates this because it, it's, it's the CRM that drives the behavior, um, because mm -hmm. you have the sales leader that drives the CRM management, which then drives the behavior. And I've, I've never met a, a sales leader in my entire career. That's like, Oh, new stakeholders entered the deal. I'm glad you moved it back to stage one. <laughs> like, yeah. why'd the deal move back? Why yeah. are we going backwards? We've yeah. been in that stage for too long. My, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, my stage, my in stage metrics are, are getting impacted because, because of this. We need to, you know, accelerate the movement by stage. Yeah. The, the accountability, the, um, how the lead, how leaders look at it, all of these things. And, it doesn't mean that, you know, if you do some discovery and then you're moving to a solution presentation and more people get inserted, that you don't do the solution presentation or that you try and do discovery in the solution presentation. Yeah. It means before that meeting, you reach out to those stakeholders and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them. So when they get to here, you're now all on the same page and can now demo or solution present to the needs of everybody. Like it's, you, we need to be a little bit more creative with how we approach things because it can yeah. all get done. You just need to think about yeah. that. Yeah, I remember once I took a role as a as a, an EMEA leader, and um, I came into the role, and the CRO told me that um, uh, there's a five to one pipeline coverage, so, you know, meaning twenty percent conversion rate, I guess, and and that's what I needed to hit my target. And so, let's say argument's sake, target is just for argument's sake, a million dollars for the quarter, um, and and I came in, and we had eight million in pipeline to close the quarter, and I was like, oh. I was thinking this, I've heard about these jobs, you know, this is the one, this is finally after, you know, having it difficult for so long, this is the time where I'm actually going to just land on my feet. And, I, and in about two weeks, three weeks, I figured out that was like, it was like the land of the living pipeline, right? You know, it was all just dead. And what was happening was that basically it was getting towards the end of the quarter and like the, the AEs were like lifting up the hypothetical like quarterly rug and just sweeping it into the next quarter, just get it, oh, dead pipeline in there. And so the obvious, the, so the first thing we did was implement MedPick. The second thing we did was like, just like lock it down. It's like, we like if you, if you don't have like the things you'd expect, like what I would class as a qualified opportunity where we have qualified with the customer that there's true value that we can provide to them. 
And they are engaged on the basis of evaluating our solution to uncover whether that value is enough to make it worthwhile them investing in it. And we're engaged with stakeholders who are helping us to be able to do our job and we understand what the process ahead of us looks like. If there's not that, it's not pipeline, let's like get it out. Like, unless it's like obviously early pipeline, we haven't had a chance to qualify that, but this is, this is stuff beyond that, right? And so what happened was the pipeline went from like this 8 million figure for argument's sake down to let's say 3 million. And all of a sudden, the, all the dashboards have lit up red for the EMEA region because they now don't have enough pipeline to cover the quarter in, in the company's eyes. And uh, I, I'll be honest with you, David, like for, uh, for a good month of that quarter, I thought I was going to get fired. <laughs> it's like, that's what they were looking at. It's the same thing as what you're talking about, the sales process, because like that's, if that's the lens they're looking at. Um, like all of it, and, and, and what actually happened was we, 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 we overachieved, not by a massive amount that quarter, but we overachieved, we did over our target. And of course now, like now everyone's like, oh, you only need three times pipeline coverage. And then, uh, you know, and, and so it was like um, one of those things where you're using the wrong, you're using the wrong inputs for basing your, your behaviors. And I think yep. that's what you're talking about, the sales process. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of it, man. It's, it's what, what is actually happening in the deal? What have you accomplished? What are you? What have you left to accomplish? Like, so I, I've created like a um, like a checklist for myself that's mm -hmm. literally about ninety questions, mm -hmm. um, about twelve questions per letter of MedPick, mm -hmm. and um, each of those quite like per letter has twelve questions. And once I answer those twelve questions, um, it, it, it for for all intents and purposes, it's everything. It's every thing that could happen inside that letter. And once I have gotten all of those answered, I am highly confident in that letter and I'm good. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how I look from a stage of the sales process perspective. It's, it's very, and, 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 you know, as we all know, and you know, MedPick is not linear and you don't go in order. And it's, it's very simply like, I look at that list of 90 questions and I simply ask myself those questions. And if it's a yes, cool, I'm, I'm good there. And then, you know, if it's a no, it's like, okay, how do I turn that to a yes? Course, and it's really yeah. that simple. And I have like a 95, 98% plus close rate that if I get all those to yes, I'm winning that deal for yeah. sure. Um, yeah. it's that. God or something that's stopping it. Like <laughs> yeah. hey, some, right. someone's like, yeah, something's happened. Yeah. I yeah. know exactly what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. You, um, you said, you said something there, uh, medic isn't linear. And it reminded me of a topic that we like to talk about, about all the different myths of medic. Ah. Which for which there are many, um, and I'd love just uh, what's your favorite medic myth? What's the one that like I guess favorite might be the wrong word, but what's the one where you hear it? You're like, oh no, not that one again. Um, there's probably two. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people think medpick is medic, medpick, med plus, whatever your version. Right. Um, is a sales process. That's that's mm -hmm. what kind of the idea of linear linearity. Um. Yeah. I've had people be like, look, I'm not showing up to a first call and being like, what's your business case for change? I was like, yeah. this is outbound sales. They don't even know. I'm like, dude, like, it's not what we're saying. We're saying at yep. some point in the deal, you need to build a business case for change and use metrics to, to drive it. Like, so like the other one is, well, you know, MedPick's like, bam, I show up to the call and I just ask it all. I'm like, no, not, not that either. No, no. Nope. Um, nope. I remember getting in a in a fight with um, one of the the big time influencers who loves to talk about gaps um, at one point because uh, there was a lot of correlation um, uh, that he was making between MedPick and Bant. And I'm like, you need to stop. Like, yeah. like, like you don't understand the thing you're arguing, and you're mm -hmm. arguing it wrong. Like, please, yeah. for the, for your sake, I want you to look good. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing, isn't it? Like the, the correlation I've seen, and I've yet to be proven wrong on this, is that anyone that is publicly criticizing Medic, I've not seen anyone yet where they don't meet this two criteria. Number one is they've never used Medic. So you never like see, oh, like, it's like, cause I get, like you do, I'm sure get tagged in these posts all the time. You click on it and you think, what's this, what's this person saying now? And then you're like, who is this person? You click and you're like, not a Medic company, not a Medic company, never worked for a company that has implemented Medic. So that's the first thing they never, ever have. And the second thing they will always have, always, is an ulterior motive. They've always got their own methodology, their own like thing, and they kind of see that 
there's noise about medic and they try and like like pivot off of that to make but what i think they fail to realize and you just see this by looking in the comments and i don't mean any disrespect here but the people that like yeah i agree like never again never seen someone on there they're like oh that's a company i really have heard of like that's a company that i've seen is doing things it's always like you know the the company that's selling like the software that does something that in a very very niche market that's so so far away from best practice that you know that and again they've never used medic and so to your point i think what they don't realize and it's a shame because like we you know, we're the same medic's not a zero sum game the more people using medic the better if these people because some of them some of them are sharp thinkers right some of them actually have really you know good things to say they have good views of the world just this one bit of like this like little chip on their shoulder about medic if they could get their head around like what actually it, it probably is then everyone would be better off and they would look good to everyone instead of just looking good to the small set of people and everyone else that uses medic that knows it being like eh, they yeah. don't know what they're talking about yeah and i love reading the comments there and i'm also i'm i'm, all, I'm often part of many of those where i'm just like yeah. flaming like no stop <laughs> wow. like you don't know what you're talking about um the other big one man and i you probably see this often um medpick is not uh is not there to teach you how to sell right you know, I, 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 I haven't figured out the right, I, I call MedPick a gap analysis checklist. That's how I look mm -hmm. at it. Um, mm -hmm. I, people can look at it however they want. I don't necessarily consider it a sales methodology. Mm -hmm. Sales methodologies in my mind, and, and maybe I'm splitting hairs or not defining it right. I, I could be being stupid about this. But to me, a sales methodology is um, something that teaches you how to sell. Yep. So like yep. Challenger is yep. a sales methodology. Yep. Um, consultative selling as it was originally wrote is a sales methodology. Um, mm -hmm. uh, spin selling and, and the stuff that Rackham teaches is a sales methodology. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot, to me, there's a lot of sales methodologies as in um, the methodology is the car. This is what I'm going to drive from start to finish to get a deal. Mm -hmm. um, my view and I, and I honestly think because of this view is why a lot of the sales training companies try and bash MedPick or mm -hmm. Medic is because they think we're comp competing with them. And right. they don't realize that, dude, we're not competition. Like yeah. we are very yeah. different things. In fact, if you actually learned what we did, what you would love us because mm -hmm. we're the way your methodology becomes actionable and effective. And um, integrated. And integrated. Because yeah. we sit on top of it and we sit on yeah. top of it from start to finish, whatever methodology you want to use, mm -hmm. and we ensure no one misses the actual ways to deploy that methodology. Yeah. So I relate it to a blind spot detector. You have mm -hmm. your car methodology that you're driving to get to where you're going. Mm -hmm. And then you have MedPick, which sits on top of it, which is integrated into your car, which while you're on your journey, stops you from crashing into a wall hitting the first person in front of you, backing up into another car, it mm -hmm. stops you from, from making a mistake. Yes. It helps you avoid accidents. It de-risks yeah. your journey. That's how I look at it. And I think that's a yeah. huge myth and for a lot of people in this conception. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I, what I would say is that the, the, way, the way you could describe that is very similar to how I think about it. But I kind of think about it um, slightly different. And the way I think about it is... One of the things I love most about Medic MedPick is the concept of the common language. Mm -hmm. and so yeah. in your, what, what MedPick does beautifully, you heard me say a little bit earlier, is, is for me, professional selling is three things. It's value, stakeholders, and process. Mm -hmm. What value is it that we provide to the customer? Meaning like what pain do we solve? What value, in, in sol what value is there in solving that pain? How is it that our solution solves that pain in a manner that's like better, different from everyone else? Who cares about that pain? Who cares about the value from solving it being stakeholders? And then like process, like how do we go from this being a spark of interest to being an evaluation, to being a closed deal, to being a renewal, to being everything in thereafter? And of course, they all bounce across each other. So you, when you think about the process, you need to think about the stakeholders as well and all that kind of stuff. But if I just come to you as a salesperson, let's say you, you, we're doing a deal review and I just say, okay, David, tell me about the value on this deal. Tell me about the stakeholders. Tell me about the process. It's like too zoomed out. You, you, I'm going to be wanting to find out one thing. You probably start talking about another thing. You're probably not wrong to talk about that thing. It's just too far zoomed out. So for me, MedPick goes, zooms in just to the right level so that we can have a very, very cohesive, very, very efficient 
uh, conversation about value stakeholding process. So if that's the base layer, right, and that's the common language that carries not just across your sales team, but your whole go-to-market team, right, because your marketing team can benefit from talking about personas the same way as you do stakeholders. The marketing can benefit from talking about metrics the same way you do. If they can start to use metrics and case studies in use cases, then you can use them to kind of urge your customers to share their metrics with you and all that good stuff. So it becomes this common language. And so where I see most people, like 95% of people use Medic is exactly as you said, it's like this, this kind of framework that sits there to kind of spot gaps. And, 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 and therefore, when you spot a gap, you apply the methodology, which is the how, to solve it. And like you said, methodology for me could be discovery for it, like discovery methodologies. It could be things like the value pyramid, free wise, new business meeting frameworks, all the things you said. How I think that the opportunity is though, and why I, I, I don't mind, I, uh, why we certainly would say that Medic is more than a qualification framework, how we use it, is because we would say to our customers, similar to what you were saying, yeah, qualification is great, but also here's a methodology that we have built around metrics. We have like an M1, M2, M3 methodology. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, you've taken it. You've taken it really to, to some awesome place, especially with the tech you've built around it. Yep. Yeah, and so the idea there is that we are actually expanding, and all we're doing because if for those like you know, we've almost got two people we're fighting against people like you and I. We've got like the 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 gurus who have never used medic and they just don't like it because they see it's competitive for all the reasons you said. Then there's like the orthodox Old Testament like medic one C can't change it, shouldn't change it, shouldn't do anything with it. It's perfect as it is, and so it's like we're fighting on two fronts. Um, so, so those people, I, they, they, they would say, well, you can't call it method. You know, we can't expand it because it's just this. And I would say, well, sure. Like if you're using gap selling as a framework to do discovery, to spot those gaps, then that's very much going to help you find pain and quantify pain. Brilliant. But what if you don't want to use gap selling, then you can use our metrics framework, right? Mm -hmm. The same thing for all the things all the way through. And so I actually think that the, the big opportunity is that if your organization that's implemented Medic and you're using it well and your organization strongly understands you know, how, it, how it fits into the opportunity, then the big opportunity for everyone, for all the other methodologies for, for anyone, is to actually expand Medic language into everything you do. So it becomes the common language that, that actually when you build a value pyramid, it doesn't necessarily talk to all like these, these new terms it talks back to medic terms, pain as, as being like a, a, a related to it, or like where if you talk about the needs, it relates to the decision criteria and those types of things. So we're kind of just expanding it that way. And I think that's a, that's a huge opportunity to expand people's existing investment in medic to bring other, other things they've invested in together as well. So that's kind yeah, of- Yeah, I completely agree. And uh, everything you just said and, and the power of that common language is incredible, man. Um, when, when me and Gregory or, or any other like person that I've taught this to that knows the framework really well, me and them can look at any deal and in five, 10 minutes, tell you all the reasons you'll win, all the reasons you'll yeah. lose, exactly yeah. what you need to do, the actions you need to take. Like it is efficient. And that's, that's one of the other things I really like. Again, going back to the fear of mortality, I like being really efficient with time. <laughs> you know, yeah. like I, I really want to make sure that the time of spending is good. Like, you and I are going to, we need to look at this the same way so we can, we can make progress on the thing the same way. Um, because if we're both speaking a different language, like it's going to take way longer to figure out, you know, how to move forward. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like the, the, the power in the common language cannot be, um, emphasized uh, enough here. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. So another myth that I hear a lot is, and this is kind of, this is kind of relating to a little bit something that you, you mentioned about that idea of, you know, my favorite, I mean, my favorite one that makes me laugh the most. And I, I call it favorite because I don't even dislike it when people come up with this because it's like, wow, could you have done any less research into this before forming a, for a strong opinion, which is that they think like similar to what you said, that you have to kind of go like you have to kind of go through everything in a first meeting. But my favorite flavor of that is when they're like, well, it's med pick, So I have to start with metrics. So you imagine right. like get onto Zoom meeting. Going, yeah. OK, so. Mr. Mrs. Customer, tell me about your metrics. Like, it's like, no, it's not that one. Um, but the, um, the one where um, people say, well, medic, med picks only for big deals. It's only for big opportunities. Yeah. yeah. And, and I get where they're coming from. I totally get it. Cause that's where it's, you know, that's where it's like, it's, it's great. It's brilliant for that. You know, you're going to get 
but the, my answer to this as a as a myth is 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 exactly why it works so well for big deals is because you should use medpick relative to the complexity of the opportunity so if you are selling DocuSign to small businesses, right? To, you know, like a, a, let's say you're selling DocuSign to a law firm that has 10 lawyers, right? Then, you know, you're probably not going to meet the, like, what would it be in a law firm? Like the general partner, like the lead partner or whatever. You know, you're probably not going to meet that person because you might have one call in a demo and then you might close via email or something like that. But it doesn't mean that you should disregard the economic buyer. Right. You shouldn't be like, well, I'm not going to meet this person, so I should just disregard them. So in that situation, there, I'm doing an extreme. Right. But like if that like one call closed deal, the salesperson should still consider the economic buyer from a perspective of, hey, the person I'm talking to who I'm hoping I can build to be like a mini champion in this this one meeting and this maybe two or three emails back and forth. I need to prime them for when they go to the economic buyer to get them to sign this off because that's probably going to happen, right? It's probably going to go to somebody who's going to go like, why do we need this? What is this? Like, can't we just send them a, like a, a raven with a, a letter on its leg and they sign it with their like quill or something, you know, I don't know. But, um, and, and so it's like that for me is like, let's, let's make it relative and let's, let's, let's make sure we still consider, is this person going to be able act, to act as a champion for us? Have we given them what they need in terms of making it clear what the decision criteria is for this person to go and get the action that we need. Yeah, man. And, and I, I look at it like that. And I also look at it as I don't care what size deal you're selling. Mm -hmm. Medic MedPick is the foundational elements of all sales transactions. Right. Forever. And I'm going to, I'll give a really like clear example. Anybody wants to fight me on this, fight me on, <laughs> fight me right here on no, this. In the comments. <laughs> all right. Now, Let's 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 create a baseline. Like this is fun. Um, so, Andy, would you agree that door to door sales, let's say pest control, yep. is one of the lowest complexity sales on the planet? Yes. Yeah. Would you would you say that um, it, it's low dollar, low complexity, fast transaction, and it's B to C? Yep. I can't tell you how many people would argue with me, David. You can't use MedPay there. All right, check this out. Um, mm -hmm. Guy came to my door the other day to sell me pest control. He's like, hey, out of curiosity, um, do you have a pest control vendor? Competition. Yes, I do. Um, mm -hmm. Would you be open to making a change? Competition versus status quo. Well, it depends. What does yours cost? Metrics. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I'm paying this. Um, well, do they charge you for other fees, other metrics? Um, what's important to you in a pest control vendor? Decision criteria. Ooh, he asked me that question too. Um, if my wife answered the door on this thing in our stakeholder, uh, this this thing in our in our household, she would be a champion. I make the decision for pest control because I pay for it. So I'm the economic buyer. He's talking to me. So you know, yes, I I pay I I look for this in a vendor. Cool. What are they not providing you? Ooh. Well, you know what they they weren't you know granulating my lawn and they weren't getting further down to my dock. Um, and so I'd love if a vendor could, you know, take care of those areas. Oh, that's a problem. Why, why is that a problem? Well, I have a nine year old and he sometimes steps on ant hills and I don't like that. So I have to granulate my own lawn to avoid the ants. Oh, well, we could take care of that service for you. There's a problem. There's an implication of pain. My nine year old's getting hurt. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, um, Hey, are you under contract? Oh, paper process. You know what? My contract's up in a couple months. Cool. Well, how are you going to make a, a, a decision to make a change? How should I follow up with you? So look, I just got MedPicked and I just showed you how MedPick can be applied. If he didn't ask one of those freaking questions, there would have been a gap in risk in his deal. He wouldn't know what I was paying, so he couldn't compare his. He wouldn't know the service that he was providing. He wouldn't know who made the decision, when the contract was up. I just proved to you MedPick is valuable in door-to-door -door pest control. <laughs> That's brilliant. Brilliant. It applies everywhere. It does. The, it does. To me, the difference, level of scrutiny. How deep do you need to go with how many people to feel confident you fully disrupt you risk it? You can be it that fast with a low complex, high transaction, door-to-door -door B2C motion. In a you know B2B high complexity motion, it could take you a year to get good 
at all of the things you mm-hmm. need. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's just the level of scrutiny you have. I love that. That's excellent. That's outstanding. I feel like we're going to need to take what you said there. I, as you were saying it, my brain was like seeing like a, a cartoon of this guy at your door, like trying to like, you know, and then you've got like the letters like being checked off as he's going through it. Cause I thought that was, uh, that was really, really fun. I like that a lot. I like I'd that actually, a lot. That, that literally happened. And that was a really fun conversation with me because I, he just had a conversation with me mm-hmm. and at the back, he's a salesperson. So at the back end, I said, can I tell you something? Do you, have you ever heard of MedPick? And I literally, I taught him MedPick <laughs> uh, <laughs> to the guy who knocked on my door. You're doing naturally, right? You're just doing it naturally. That's brilliant. You know, yeah. there's so many things. I mean, I, I think we've talked about this before, but like I started, my first job in sales was knocking on doors, B2C. And in the UK, it's it's called double glazing. So that is like the, I know in the US, I think like secondhand car sales, it seems like the lowest rung of sales, but like yeah, in the UK, start. like we've got secondhand car sales, of course, but this is way lower. This is like as low as it gets. And um, yeah, and, and, and that was what I did for a while. And there were some things I learned doing that that I still use today, still use today that's, you know, and, and one of the things I loved about that, you know, one of the things that's interesting, just to digress a little bit, one of the things that's interesting is I found it really hard to move from B2C sales to B2B in, in as much as people wouldn't hire me. People would be like, we love, like, love, like you've got like this, like self starter or this kind of like they could, you know, I, obviously all of my, all of my uh, stories or like all of my like interview answer, interview question answers all orientated around knocking on people's doors, like all like kind of what we would call like hustle type approach. People are like, we love that, but you know, you just come back when you've got some experience with B2B and it's like, well, how does that work? That's like a catch 22 if there was one. Come back when you've got some experience, you're not gonna give me the experience. Um, and so I found it really hard to get in, right? But the thing that I think, there's a few things, there's like a, a, a few things I think are really, really strong about the people that are doing those like high velocity sales engagements. And one of them is it just, trains your emotional intelligence like you would not believe it's like an accelerator because a typical like a typical salesperson today like a would would probably come out of college university and they might go into some sort of customer facing role maybe they'll start as an sdr and then they'll go into the field right if they're an sdr they're booking meetings they might be sitting on a few meetings but maybe one two three meetings a week and then they become an ae and then what have they got like their commercial maybe maybe at most two or three customer meetings like like well, like how many sales cycles a month, right? Not many, not many, like on the like grand scheme of things, and you're knocking on doors and you're doing like cycles, cycles, full cycle. You're knocking on the door, they're booking your meeting, you're going and selling your product, you're doing the paperwork, you're doing the contract on the day. I think that was such a good, good, good experience of just yep. like learning, like how to handle objections, how to, how to deliver value, how to read people, all that kind of stuff. So I feel like, if I ever interview someone that they come from that background, they're like, they've got like a massive level up in my mind rather than a level down. Yeah. I, I have a deep respect for anybody who does door to door. Anybody who does door to door and knocks on my door, I have, a, I have a conversation with. I've tried to recruit yeah. someone to come work for me at times because it is the hardest thing to sell. Um, yeah. Because you would like just start the starting point of door to door. You are interrupting somebody at home. Yeah. Massive. Not at a place yeah. of business, even though I work from home, so it's technically both. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like the starting point of that is, is so is like, um, my, uh, my first sales job, um, I was selling, uh, uniforms, um, uh, and floor mats and shop towels for a company called Aramark, um, five year contracts. <laughs> if you didn't close it on the, f- on the first call, your win rates were like 5%. Like it, you needed to five year contracts, one call close. Um, uniforms, format, shop towels. I cut my teeth there and, you know, 200 calls a week, 16 appointments a week, knocking on 30 doors, submitting four to five proposals, like the high velocity, high action, immediate close, build value really, really fast, identify pain really, really fast. Um, that that's where I cut my teeth and where I learned so much. Like everything else in life has been easier since then. Yeah. Oddly enough, that was one of the most fun jobs ever. My, yeah. my second job in SaaS, um, I worked for a, a startup and um, I was like their first commercial employee, I guess, like the first non-founder employee. And um, they, it was an e-commerce platform for, for, for a B2B industry, um, for a vertical market, I should say, sorry. Um, and um, 
we, there's two things about that job that always, I always reflect on really interestingly. One was there were five year contracts for a SAS, five year contract. There's no, like, there's no, there is no negotiation here. It's a five year contract. And the second one is we don't negotiate on price. It's just like, that is the price based on this, this tier or whatever you're on. And I'd started that job and it was like, that's, that's that. There is no, there is no change here. It's, that's it. It's black and white. It's that. And if they didn't want the five-year contract or they didn't want to pay the price and I couldn't convince them to, it was closed loss. There was no like going backwards and forth. And I used to like, I, I reflect back on that so much of like how much better, like if, if you could test this, and I don't know if any company would be brave enough to test this in B2B. But if you could take one of those like really well established, maybe public companies and just say, right, for the next year, we're doing three year contracts, right? And um, no discounts, like net, how much worse slash better would they be? I don't know the answer. I don't feel like they'll be worse. I really don't. I feel like if you could get people, everyone to buy into it, I feel like they'll be better off. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a tough gig too. Five years and five year contracts are uh, five year contracts are no joke. That's like that's a, the, the, most marriages don't last five years. <laughs> yeah, no, right? Yeah, it's so funny. And then the funny thing was that one of the founders was had been selling up until that point, and and he still continued to sell for this company. And I found out like later that he was just writing any kind of contracts he wanted. But it, for, what he told me was it's only five years, and, and of course, like he would outperform me as well. Yeah. Like A, because he was like way more experienced than I was. B, because it was his company. He was one of the founders. He was like, the, and but C, I didn't know this at the time, but C, because he was basically discounting. He would do like, sometimes there'll be a use case for them to have two e-commerce platforms, like two stores. And he would like do like, well, if you buy one, I'll give you the other one half price. But then he would tell me, then we were only counting because there was no, because the, every pri every store should have been the same price. There was no like, we weren't measuring sales via ARR. We were measuring sales by units. So he'd be like, I've sold, 10 stores this month, how many have you sold? I'd be like, I've sold five, but really he had sold five as well. He'd just given five away for free or like with right. short contracts. Right. It's like, right. and, and the five you sold were infinitely more profitable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, but he used to, like, I, I almost wouldn't mind like reflecting back now about it because he, he got like the best from me in that kind of way. But it was oh, just yeah. the stick. The stick he used to give me he used to like go, oh you know i've beaten you again and it's like hang on a minute you're playing with cheat codes i'm playing i'm playing right. like the real game here right, right. so yeah oh, wow. that's, uh, that's shady but uh yeah good, talking good of good um, him for getting the most out of andy white <laughs> yeah i know right yeah he's yeah um talking about people knocking on the door is a fun thing uh someone knocked on my door maybe a month six weeks ago um hmm. and i was like i was like who's this so i went out and uh, it was like a 16 year old kid. And he was asking if I would take him to prom. He liked my car. He asked me if, I, if I'd take him to prom or like his prom. Not, not, oh yeah, sorry, let me be clear here. Like I, refer, I phrased that wrong. He was asking me if I'd drive him to his prom. No, I got you, I got you. <laughs> my yeah. eyes lit up because wow, the, the confidence and, and uh, that, that's a person like that. That's, that's a person that's going places. Yeah, exactly. Your I, car, uh, but sorry, keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I actually, cause it was caught on the ring doorbell and, um, I thought, yeah, let's do this. And so I made, I, we're making a little like mini video about it. Cause I kind of caught him and I was like, you know, I was asking him like, what made you do it? Like I was trying to get across to this like 16 year old kid that that as a trait in life to see something you want and be brave enough to knock on somebody's door. You don't know could be a complete stranger was a complete stranger to get what you want is, is something that he needs to lean into and just be like that. It doesn't matter yes. if he goes into sales. Whatever he does in his life, that's going to set him up really, really well. But uh, I, you're, I found you're either going to be a, a serial killer, or you're going to be like an amazing <laughs> entrepreneur. And yeah. the funny thing is, like, there is a very fine line between between the two at times. <laughs> um, um, yeah. The, yeah. That, that's like the difference in a slight personality trait. Is uh, that yeah. I'm not me saying they've actually like studied that. Like, there's a yeah. there's a very you oh, know, really? interesting line between people who. Uh, do terrible things and all sorts of business owners. So, um, wow. you know, hopefully he channels that for good. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Uh, David, something that um, I, I loved from our, our previous conversation we had before is we're very aligned on our view of the importance of preparation for mm. engagements with customers yep. and, uh, you know, how we sort of see discovery and all those types of things. One of the things that um, I love that you told me about before that I was like, man if, if david is up for sharing this with 
our audience, this is going to be one of those little gems that we're definitely going to cut and put into its own little soundbite and that kind of thing, which is how you approach first meetings. Yeah. So there's a, as, as you know, and I've shared this with you, um, I've tried to make medic, med pick, whatever version you like to use as actionable as humanly possible. Like to me, that's, that is the, the power of it is, uh, finding where you have a problem and taking action. I, I look at a medic med pick as a system to drive action. And so to me, action is taken through the concept of plays. So like I look at it as like, Hey, this is, you know, this is where we are in the game. Here's the play we're going to run to move the chains, advance the ball down the field. Mm-hmm. So I look at, I, and however you want to look at it, I look at taking action as, as running you know, plays like in a game. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, uh, I've written a book that has 79 plays in it. And uh, it's it's called The Sales Tactician's Playbook. And uh, I, I look at it literally like X's and O's, like, you know, playing a game. And uh, there's a couple plays in there that uh, are variations of themselves that both drive... Um, discovery, identification of pain and implication of pain um, that drive, you know, business case and value realization um, and things like that and, and solution alignment. And um, one of them is called the faces of discovery play. Um, there's also a faces of the problem play that takes what I'm about to share um, and broadens it to entire teams of stakeholders and end users with specific quotes and their face tied to them um, that uh, can help you um, remove uh, the uh, the feelings of indecision in advance of deal. But I'll, I can maybe talk about that later. But um, mm-hmm. the faces of discovery play is, is, is my favorite. Um, and I've been teaching this to salespeople for close to six years now. Um, and the ones that adopt, I'm building, I'm building here. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get there. Um, yeah. The ones that adopt this play have a, a 90 plus percent conversion rate from first meeting to second meeting. In other words, if you do this right, the person that you're talking to is going to lean in and is going to talk to you more and bring more people to the party over 90%. I mean, it is, it is statistically significant. It is, in my mind, one of the silver bullets for discovery. Okay, so here's the plan. Before walking into any meeting, um, virtual or in person, mm-hmm. do your homework on the individual, on the business, mm-hmm. um, on the persona, mm-hmm. and the problems that those people are faced with. So for okay. big accounts, public accounts, annual reports, um, reading news, reading investor briefings and presentations, listening to earnings calls. For public, for private uh, accounts, reading the news, looking at their LinkedIn profiles, um, looking at their competition, um, reading their website, um, things like that. And what you're trying to do through, and, and I like to think of like this is you're, you're you're trying to put a bunch of like puzzle pieces together to form a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is, hey, I'm about to meet with you. What problem do you as an individual, as a person inside your role in the business and your business as a whole, what challenges are you likely faced with right now that my solution, that what I'm ever selling can help with? Mm -hmm. And what I do is I take that information. I start with their LinkedIn picture and I literally put their picture on a slide, their circle just Mm -hmm. right there. I then title the slide, what I think you care about. And then I put three to four bullets based on all this homework, my hypothesis on the mm-hmm. slide. Mm-hmm. Then comes the narrative around it. The narrative around it is very simple. It's, um, and you execute this. Uh, if you're a fan of the ASEM framework, appreciate time, confirm time, set end game agenda, mutual agenda. And then you go into a level of this, Hey, before we get started, before, you know, I, I show you how we can help. Is it okay if I ask, you know, a few questions and, you know, for us to kind of chat a little bit right there, you pull up that slide and you say, Hey, look, 
I like to make sure that, uh, again, fear of mortality here, Andy, there's a lot of, a lot of common themes here. Um, I like to make sure, um, our time is well spent and mm-hmm. I always do my homework on the individual to make sure that, um, we are here to have a productive conversation for you. Mm-hmm. So I did my homework and I pull up the slide and I said, um, I put this together for this conversation, um, as an outsider looking in, and this is key, I'm probably wrong. People love to correct you. I'm probably wrong. As an outsider looking in, I am probably wrong. But what I saw is, and I read the slide, A, B, C, bullets. Um, I'd love to have a conversation about this and for you to tell me maybe where I'm right, where I'm wrong, and um, where maybe I've missed the mark. And I'd love to go a little deeper with you. Is that okay? I love that. And then I shut up. Yeah. And they read the slide. They see their picture. And they say, that's me on a slide. And I'm like, yeah. And then they're like, no, 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 no. You got these right, but you got this way wrong. Let me tell you yeah. more about that. And they just a spill. And I just sit there frantically yeah. taking notes. Yeah. I love that. And and everyone knows what's happening here, but just to call it out, it's 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 the for me the biggest part of this is is there's many components. For me, the biggest part of this is you have hyper accelerated your route to credibility with that prospect because you've done a number of things. You've shown that you value their time because they've seen that you've invested time ahead of the meeting for them, for them, solely for them. And like in your talk track, it it, it supported that as well. And so you've done that. You've also shown that even if incorrect, you have a relevant perspective because it's like, imagine if one of those bullet points is wrong, it's like, it's not, it's unlikely to be wildly wrong. You know, it's going to be like, you know, it might be that, you know, one of your major issues right now is like their electronics company, you might have a major issue with supply chain from, you know, chips from Asia or something like that. And they might be like, actually, no, we actually get our chips from somewhere else. Right. But, yeah. you know, the fact that you know that they might have that problem is, is, has actually caused a, wow, this person knows what they're talking about, but it be also a chance for you to go, oh, okay, so that's actually no longer a problem. So it's, it's just, it's just excellent. It's excellent. And I always think this, I talk about it like this, it's like so our customers are so, so used to our uh, for salespeople just acting desperate. Like it's quite hard to get a meeting with a prospective customer. And so when we get one, we typically don't like to let it go easily. We want to try and do the best we can, even though, you know, I would say the level of preparation as a standard in their industry doesn't support that as a hypothesis. And so when we see our customers are so used to salespeople engaging, either doing a bad job or maybe doing a good job, but it's just not enough value for make it worthwhile to, to evaluate their solution, but they won't let it go. And therefore they chase the customer around, you know, around their inbox. You know, they would even turn up at their house if they knew where they lived. And it just tells the customer, wow, this person must be desperate. But for you to put the time in up front, it says, it says to the customer, wow, this person must genuinely believe they have value to offer me because why else would they have invested their precious time otherwise? And so, yeah, I love, yeah, I love, me, I love that. It shows you, you came to play the game. Um, you, there's an ego stroke with, with the picture. The picture is key. Like people get a little weirded out by the picture. Like uh, the, the seller, sellers get weirded out by that. Mm-hmm. I've never had a customer get weirded out by that. Not mm-hmm. once. Every customer I've ever done this to has said, or a prospect, whatever, um, has said, oh my God, it's me on a slide. Oh my God, where'd you get that? Oh my God, that's really cool. I've never seen anyone do this before. Yeah. It's always a, oh my God, something. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. It, and, and by the way, psychologically speaking, people like looking at themselves. Yeah. So like I'm, you're immediately creating affinity for the conversation. The, uh, to your point, huge trust acceleration by, by the hypothesis. The I'm probably wrong is key because what you're doing is removing all ego and you're yeah. inviting correction and people yeah. love to correct you. So therefore yeah. they will um, now lean in and Ultimately, what I'm trying to do with this is this concept of earning the right. If you just show up and say, hey, what are your challenges? I'm not telling you yet. I don't trust you. But you earn the right to do it Mm -hmm. through this level of prep. And oh my God, you have now, now they are going to give you the real, real. And they're willing to give you a second layer than they normally would. 
yes. that then yeah. to your point accelerates this deal forward. Um, yeah. yeah, man, it's this is like a, it, this to me is a cheat code. Like you do this, yeah. code that. Um, and by the way, people would be like, "Oh, that takes so much time." I've boiled this down to like five ten minutes. Oh. If you can't take yeah. ten minutes before a meeting, like get yeah. out of sales. Yeah, like, yeah, seriously. you're not in the wrong. Yeah, I hundred percent agree. Hundred percent agree. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one quick anecdote along the same lines as this, as, as that kind of I'm probably wrong bit. One of our tactics we love to, to, to get um, our, our folks to do, um, and I, you know, something I always got my teams to do as a sales leader is to play back the decision criteria to the customer once you've mm-hmm. kind of started to establish it, even from a first meeting. So you'd say, sounds to me, you know, and this is one of the beautiful things about MedPick is people have their own voice. So they don't have to say it the same way I would, but this is kind of a clinical way of saying it. Dear Mr. Customer, it's great to meet you, blah, 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 blah. Sounds to me like um, in this solution, you're looking for these things or these things are important to you. And then, of course, the beautiful thing to do is to lace in some of your own strengths in there. So Eva, like, you know, you'd say something along the lines of, um, uh, it, 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 it sounds like this wasn't something you'd previously considered as being important, but from our conversation, it seems like this is something that will be important for you achieving the goals you want, whatever it is. And, and I, I'd love to do that. And it, it's um, the, the, the hyper professional move here is to get your, if it's a technical decision criteria part, to get the sales engineer solution consultant to do that. So you introduce them as a point of contact into your, into your deal as well. And then you can handle like the, the, the economical and the relationship side of the decision criteria as well yourself. So it kind of splits those two out. Um, but I had a guy on my team once, and this is not a tactic that I would do. And this is one of the things I love about sales is because people have different sort of flavors and styles and things. But to your point about I'm probably wrong, um, he used to do this and he would put he would put something wildly incorrect in. Not necessarily that wild, but something that was just completely out out of thin air in, in as one of these bullet points. Whether it was to do with a pain, whether it was to do with the decision criteria, whether it was to do with anything. Because he wanted to check a couple of things. He wanted to check if the customer was actually reading it, and then they'll, and, 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 and or if they are, yeah, would they would they call him out? Did they care enough to go? You know what, Jim? In this case, you've got that wrong, and here's here's actually everything's right except for that. Forced them to confirm everything else as well. So I've always I've always I, that's not something I would do because I I personally, and this is one of the beautiful things about sales why everyone shouldn't be the same like robots. I feel like I, 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 I credit more not coming across as having something wrong. Like I, I feel like with my customers, I don't want them to think that I misheard them or like made something up. But to some people that like for, for this guy, that was, that was a win for him. There's a, uh, he, he has zero need to be liked. Um, zero need to be right. Um, I, I dig that. Um, I love the confidence in that. I, I, I there's a, there's a psychology and there's a, there's a, a, a little almost bit of mental manipulation there that, that goes maybe a little, a little indexing far, but, um, I really love that. Like there's, there's just, there's just something about that, that the, the forcing of correction, the forcing of deeper conversation, the forcing of pay, paying attention. Again, that's someone that, that has came to the party to play and, um, is one or two steps ahead of, of the other people. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I like to think of things like a game of chess, like that. That's that's someone who's like, yeah, I'm I'm two moves ahead of you right now, and I, I dig that. I love that. That's awesome. Cool. Okay, David. Last question. It's a quick fire one. What yeah. is not your most important, but what is your favorite element of MedPick? Which letter is your favorite? Ooh, um, it's got to be metrics, man. I am a big business case guy. Um, I think with with Archimedes, um, with the right lever, I can move the world. Um, with, uh, with the right business case, I can make anything happen. Um, so, you know, to me that that's it. Uh, economic buyer would probably be a very, 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 very close second. Um, uh, but yeah. I love that. David, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show and, uh, where can people find you if they want to connect with you? Oh yeah. Uh, hit me up on LinkedIn, uh, David Weiss, at the sales collective, uh, David Weiss deal doc. Um, just look, I, I get out of bed every single day to help the sales community sell better. Um, so if I can ever do anything for you, just like literally I'm, I'm here for you. So, um, Andy, uh, seriously, bro. Um, I, I love our conversations. Um, every time we talk, it just makes the rest of my day better. So, yeah, um, likewise, I appreciate that. thank you, dude.